So you guys should remember how to do your Mercurial updates. There's a very short lecture file that doesn't say much more than download Rob's PDF versions of his lecture notes and create a directory for today. All right, everybody, I just updated the Mercurial repository. So if you've grabbed it, just go ahead and do another pull and update. It's not very exciting. There's just basically create a directory, make a symbolic link, which you guys haven't done before, but just take it that it works. Then run the three W gets. All right, guys, let's go ahead and get started. Today we've got Rob Braswell from Applied Geo Solutions. Did I have that right? Yes. Rob has been a professor at UNH for quite a while and is still an affiliate faculty member at UNH. And Rob and I collaborated on a number of projects, including uh, IRMA, the Environmental Response Management Application. And Rob has graciously agreed to show us the R statistical package, which I don't know either. So I'm joining you guys in becoming a student on this one. So I'll be in IRC with you all, and I'm gonna hand over the microphone to Rob. Okay. And Okay, all right, thanks. Okay, so like Kurt said, I'm Rob Braswell. I, um, work a small company in Newmarket, uh, work on, among other things, using satellite remote sensing data to um, monitor forest degradation and deforestation. It's one of, one of our things. I'm also generally interested in geospatial data and mapping, and that's how Kurt and I got started working together. I guess what it, the main thing I want to do is just to kind of expose you to the basics of R, get a little experience just typing in R commands and seeing what happens. Um, exposed to the flavor of the language. It's a different kind of language probably than um, you've used before. Who, anyone use R a little bit? A little bit, a lot? I'm looking for helpers, just you, okay. <laughs> All right, so what I'll do is just uh, first give a little intro, um, some show you some background information, um, some things on the web, talk about data types and functions, and then we'll um, do some exercises. A couple of years ago, I taught a course. It was, uh, say, 14 weeks, and each week we had a different topic, and we used R. And I tried this a few times before using other languages, IDL, MATLAB, things like that. I found that R worked the best for various reasons. It's really easy to get spun up on. It has pretty much everything already right there. It turned out once we got the basics down, it was really easy to sort of build on top of the basics. You know, we, you can see we covered like a huge range of stuff from just doing basic stats to doing classification problems, um, week six, dealing with messy data, week seven, bootstrapping and jackknifing, some, you know, pretty fancy but really practically usable statistics things that turned out not to be as sophisticated as we thought going in. Monte Carlo approaches kind of did an intro to time series analysis, neural networks, spatial stats, and so on. Even image processing, which initially I thought, you know, R is going to be fairly weak on image processing, but it turned out there are quite a lot of, of things available in R to do image processing. So my main point here is, in a fairly short span of time, you can use R to do lots of different things across the uh, data analysis spectrum. All right, so what is R? R is a language for data analysis and visualization. It does both of those things really well. The advantages are, you know, it's free. It has a lot of functions ready to go without having to get add-ons. But if you want add-ons, there are over 3,000 packages available currently. It's a huge number of, of things. And a large developer and user community, which means it's changing, it's becoming more solid than even it already is. It's been around a long time. If there's not something available in R right now, there will be soon, probably. So, you know, a few disadvantages. For me, even now, you know, I'm primarily a Python programmer, so I use Python for most applications that I work on. I find that the R syntax is a little awkward. It's hard to get used to. It's, it has a kind of a sort of a complex hierarchy of objects. It's a little sometimes hard to understand what the, the object is that you're working with. It doesn't want to tell you what it is as much as Python objects do. When you really want to get in and understand what's going on, R can be a little, it's a little opaque. But beyond that, you know, for large data sets, uh, maybe not the best for non-standard formats. Like if somebody just hands you some crazy data logger format, I find that R is not as easy to use as Python. And of course, like a lot of other languages, if you're just doing loops in R, it's going to be slow. So I just want to tour some resources that are available on the web. The first one, I'm not going to click on this one, but this is uh, one of my favorite online R introductions. It's 
It's got a lot of pages, a lot of stuff. It walks you through the basics really well. Uh, this one, second one, is the the main R website. From there, you can click on manuals, and then there's a lot of documentation, a lot of interesting stuff. This one in particular, I think, is useful. This R intro .pdf. From my course, I've got a bunch of materials that I'm currently in the process of cleaning up. Uh, there are a lot of. Uh, yeah, I can show you. Let's see, I've got it broken down. I've gotten as far as putting things into separate directories. But I have assignments, some data sets, lectures, you know, going through the semester, scripts. Feel free to look through this stuff, and if there's something in there you want to use or if you want to ask me about, you can do that. Uh, also, yep, there's a blog, which I just discovered actually, and it's got a lot of really great stuff. It's uh, this one. So it's pretty up-to-date, and you can just sort of flip through there and see what people are doing. Like I saw this one today. Do your random variables need to groove more? You know, <laughs> you can check that out. And this one, I think, is they're actually making uh, wave files, making sounds from data, so you can like listen to your data. Anyway, um, then there's this graphics gallery, which I actually find really useful. Um, this guy here, if I have a connection, you'll be able to see it. So this is a graphics gallery. And you know, sometimes I'll just go browsing through here to see, like, if I got some data, and I, can, I have an idea what I want the sort of the product to look like. I'll just flip, you know, just flip through these, and I'll at least get started. You know, I can take something like this, or you know, like the bunny, and I can make it look like, um, you know, like what I want, or make it, you know, use my data. So here's one that I like a lot when you have. Uh, multivariate data set and there are a lot of points and they clump together and you want to see what the correlation really looks like but you know without the overplotting this is one that that I use it plots out all the columns of your data and then indicates sort of how many points there are within each of these little cells uh, yeah just introducing what the data types are in R I mentioned that it's a it's a little more complicated than Python and since there are more different kinds of things in R there are there's sort of a hierarchy of data types. They have what they call sort of atomic types, which have a mode, and then a variable uh, is going to have a, a class, it's going to belong to a certain class. But you don't really need to worry about that so much. Practically speaking, day-to-day -day working with R, you're going to be using one of these types of data types. So a variable, when you assign something to a variable, it's most likely going to be one of these things. It's going to be a vector, which is an ordered sequence of things that are all the same type, like it could be all numeric or all character. Um, it could be an array, uh, which is essentially a vector, except it can have two or more dimensions. And it doesn't have to be strictly rectangular. It can be a, a ragged array. It's essentially a vector of vectors. A matrix is, there are more, stricter, more strict rules that apply to a matrix because matrices are used for, for doing matrix mathematics, basically. So they're strictly rectangular, and they're two-dimensional, and have other sort of properties that they keep track of. A list is sort of the odd one. It can be anything. It's like a list in Python. Um, and it's actually one I use the least, oddly. Um, a factor I use a lot. A factor describes discrete classes. So if you take a bunch of integers and convert them to a factor, it doesn't think of those things as numeric quantities anymore. It thinks of them as types. So you can classify data that way. You can uh, group data and have R do operations like take averages and and do statistical summaries on groups using these factors. And a data frame, actually one of the most useful data types that I've not found in Python, and I've had to make myself in Python and haven't been really happy with what I've made, is essentially a named list of vectors or factors. It's like a spreadsheet. So it knows what the columns are. The columns are the same type. And it can do operations on the columns independently, or you can slice rows and columns out the way you can do with a spreadsheet. So it's a, really, it's a really useful, very commonly used data type. And you can read a CSV file, for example, right into a data frame. R is a functional language, and that just means that the way you, you use it is you take objects, you take data, and you apply functions to them. Um, and then you get some data that comes out. This is sort of a, actually, this is sort of a vocabulary list of R functions from like uh, the second week of my class. So you can see that we have uh, built-in statistical functions, math functions, graphing functions, data types, conversions, text, help, lots of other things. And also, interestingly, it has, it comes with built-in data sets, which I think is kind of unusual. You can just type letters, and you get all the letters of the alphabet. Sunspots, and you get C 
Sunspot data. So it comes built in with data sets that you can use for just testing things out, for teaching, for, for learning stuff. But you'll see that in, um, actually you'll see a lot of the stuff I'm talking about in the uh, exercises. The, okay, part two. So we'll get through as much of this as we get through. I'd like to at least try to get through the first part, introduction to R. And I did this in my first class and it was, it's really effective. It's a little, you might think, it's a little tedious to just have someone say, you know, type this in and see what happens. But actually, I found for myself that that's a good way of learning the language. Um, and along the way, there are questions about, you know, do you understand what just happened? And if you don't, you can ask me. But basically, the idea is that read through this, work through it, and ask questions as you go along. I'll move around. And we start really just by starting up R. Basically, I'd like everybody to do that now if they haven't. You know, I guess you have to install it. And you'll see a little prompt that looks like the uh, greater than sign. So the basic idea is you'll see a prompt that looks like the greater than sign, and that's where you type R commands. So there are different ways you can have, um, it's like Python, different ways you can interact with R. You can just uh, have a terminal session where you type commands and see what happens, or you can write a script and run the script. Um, what we'll be doing is just <coughs> typing the commands, hitting return to see what happens. A couple other quick things. So the first thing is at the prompt, type three and hit return. Okay, and you'll see, and then there are other things that follow, um, doing some arithmetic, and then you go from there. One of the things you see is that the assignment operator I use is the equal sign. A lot of people in the R world use a less than and a hyphen. It's a style thing, and R allows you to do both, but I prefer the equal sign. And if you go forth and use R, I would suggest you use the equal sign. I just, it makes sense to me to use something that's one character instead of... What's the comment character in R? Comment character is a pound sign. That's a comment. This is assignment. And you guys have done programming, so you know, one, one of the things we talked about, because there were people that were new to programming, is the idea of assignment is when you say x equals 3, you're taking the number 3 and you're storing it into the variable x. And that's uh, the beginning of all the great things that happen. You're getting installed, you're typing stuff. And you'll notice a lot of times, the um, sometimes when you do something, it will emit a result to the screen. Like if you, if you don't have an assignment, so if I just say sign of point 0.1 and hit return, it'll, instead of assigning it to a variable, because I didn't, I didn't provide any assignment, it will put that value on the screen. You'll see that underneath the prompt when you hit return. If I say y equals sine of point 0.1, then you don't see anything, right? Because it's assigning the result of this function to the variable y. Subsequently, you could type y and hit return, and you'll see what the value of y is. Is this purely significant, or is it? Good question. Like Python, R treats all numeric values kind of the same in a way. So if you do 4 divided by 3, it's going to do integer division. If you want to force it to do floating point division, you give it a decimal point on one or both. And the other thing is, if you want to see what happens, you can't break anything, just start typing stuff. If you want to see what happens without the period, or with the period. Well, that's interesting. I'd hit, I typed the letter Q now, if I were you. So what did you do? I just, uh, Question mark? Maybe that's not what I did. Well, so I did letters. Letters, and that gives you letters, yeah. I tried to just looking. Yeah. I so, so do I have the question mark here? Probably. No, I don't think so. I, oh, oh. I was just. You wanted to see what happened if you type a question mark. Yeah. But that's I can't. Why, why is this plus now as well? Yeah. So that's the continuation mark. Yeah. If you see a plus. And actually, you'll see that, um, actually, when you get to the bottom of the first page, even, you'll see that if you, um, if you enter a, uh, an expression and you hit return before it's done or before it can actually perform a calculation, like if I type 3 plus and I hit return, you're not done. So it'll give you a plus sign on the next line. And it's like 3 plus what? And if you, you give it something... You have two choices. A lot of times I'll get to this point because I have a whole bunch of stuff here. 
and I'll get the plus and I'll be like, ah, I have no idea, like, there's 50 parentheses, I don't know which one I left out. I'll just hit uh, escape or control, you know, I'll just start, I'll get out of it, <coughs> basically. I think control C or escape should break you out of this line continuation mode, if you see that. I mean, if you know what you need to type to finish the command, you can do that. Yeah. Why is Okay, so the first the first letter on the second line is n 19. 19, 20, 21, oh, 22, yeah. 23, 24, 25, 26. Yeah. So what it's doing here is it's counting out how many rows of output you have. Or, or essentially how many items of output you have. And what, what item be begins on that row? And this is item number 19. Okay. Yeah, see, that's a little confusing. That's this. If you, um, if it's this uh, continuation mark. So if I type 3 plus and hit return, then I haven't completed my um, expression. It, it doesn't know what to calculate. So the plus you see down here underneath the prompt is actually asking you for more stuff, which is, it can, can be confusing when you're first starting because it looks like a plus sign. So typically when I see that, so if I say 3 plus, see it gives me the plus sign underneath. Um, a lot of times that'll happen if you have lots of parentheses and things and um, it's, you, you just mess something up and it can't do the calculation. Control C gets me out of it, might get you out of it too. Um, or you can just complete the line, 3 plus, and I say 4 or 5, then it gives me the answer. The other thing someone noticed is, what are these things in the brackets here? Well, this is just telling you, it's, it's giving you a kind of a running count of the items that have been output. So letters returns, it's probably a, um, a vector of characters. So it's saying the first item starts here on the first row. And then this is actually overrunning the screen coming out there like that. So this is still the first row. Then the second row starts at the 20th item. 20, 21, 22, so on to 26. So the first one is zero, no, is one, not zero. The first one is one, and R starts counting with one. Mm. That's another thing that's different from other languages. Thank you for bringing that up. So I can say X equals letters. What's X at zero? X at zero just tells me the data type. X1 gives me the letter A. X26 better give me Z. Does it let you do the minus, like Python does, when you go from the back end of things? So x square brackets minus inside of it? It does it differently. Uh, let's see. Let's go see. Let me remind myself what it does, because I've been using uh, only Python for a while. So there's x. x. Oh, looks like it deletes that item. So it deletes it right there at that position. That's right. What if I said minus 3? Yeah, the behavior of the minus sign is interesting. So if you guys see this, once you've learned one programming language mm -hmm. and you go to the next one, it's not trivial to learn another one, but you can use what you've got from the first language to leverage into the next one, and you'll see similar patterns. A lot of things will be the same, but some things will be different, and you'll have to spend a lot of time focusing on what's different and remembering those things. That's a big point. Also, on the flip side of that is you have an idea of what kinds of things can be different, and you'll say, how does this language do array subscripting? Like, does it, like Kurt just said, does it have a minus? Can I use a, put a minus sign in there? And what, what if I do, and what will happen? Like Python, you can put a minus sign in the array, and it gives you a certain behavior. And R, it gives you some other behavior. And I actually spend, like, right now, I spend a lot of time just trying stuff. So if I go a long time without using Python, or if I go a long time without using R, I have to just sit and like type a bunch of things and I always have an interactive window open even if I'm writing a long you know really long data processing script you know we have some pretty big ones and I get to something that I really should know but I've forgotten you know and I'll go type and just to make sure that if I say do a certain kind of slice or a certain kind of syntax it's really doing the thing I want Can you get function or is that just 99? Yes. Okay, this, this C, the letter C, uh -huh. 
is this is a it's an R oddity, right? It's a <coughs> it's actually a function, and I wouldn't name a function in my language with just one letter, but they have, and it's called it's C. It's the concatenate or the concatenate operator. If I say C one comma two comma three, it's going to create a vector of numbers one two three. If I say C ninety nine, it's going to create a vector with just one thing in it. And the point of that section, and I think I might have a little verbiage about it, the point of that section is that a number is just a vector of length one in R. And that's different from Python. You know, in Python, a list is, a, is its own thing. If you're a list, you're a list. If you have one element in the list, you're a list with one element. But in R, the concept of a numeric, of the basic numeric object, say a number, is, is a vector, basically. And I see some people are getting error messages. That's good. It's good to like see them and then try to see, you know, what kind of error. Me uh, different languages error messages can be uh, provide different levels of insight into what you're doing. When you have the uh, oh, sorry. Like the pals not in your it's it's not like a struct, right? It's not like you're creating. It's it's just the name. Sorry, where are you? This, when you're doing the dots in here. Oh, oh the pounds in here. Yeah. It's, it's just the name. Dots. It's not Isn't that? It's not a yeah, I did that for, for people like you yeah. <laughs> who might go, what <laughs> the? And I still, when because I see. I tried doing the pal dot name, and I'm like, wait, that's not even there. It's, it's not an attribute of pals? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. It's, and, there's, and there's nothing like that at all? It's a valid character. You could basically create any sort of data structure you want, I guess, with the basic data types. Mm -hmm. But they don't. They're not referenced in the same way. Okay. They're not like. Um, do they use the pointing arrows? Do they use it's not. It's not the same. You don't have. It's not like you have an object with methods or right. or attributes that you can reference that way. Right. They're all sort of done functionally, oh. which can be a little weird because functions like plot, for example, mm -hmm. they get overridden all the time. So if I have a thing that's a time series object, and I say plot that thing, I think I'm calling plot. It's just like my regular old plot. But it's actually been overridden, and it's plots in a special time series format. So that's something to watch out oh, okay. for in R, is it there are ways to, to find out that it's doing that. Uh -huh. For example, all the, doc the R documentation is super strict. You know, they have to say, do they have a plot method? What does it do? You know, how is it different? And all of the things like these specialized plot methods have their own special name too. So plot.ts is its specialized name. So I could use the use the generic plot if I wanted to. So it's a little confusing if you're used used to object-oriented programming because right, right. it, it kind of is. Yeah. But it's also kind of <laughs> not in a way. So yeah. But your first question was periods are a valid character. So I could say my dot data is c one two three four. Okay, so the dot, if you're used to uh, Python or some other languages, it's, it's not <laughs> indicating that data is an attribute of my. It's just saying I have a variable called my.data. It's really common in R. People use it a lot, and it still looks weird to me. Is there a difference between a single quote and a double quote? No. Around strings? Not that I know of. Do you see one? Nope. Oh, okay. I don't think so. I think it's like Python in that way. Uh, A is. Yeah. Um, I got an error when I like, lost my list. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I got an error when I typed a one here, but it worked with an L. Is it, is that it should be an L. Okay. So, um, what it's <laughs> it's basically saying what kind of plot do you want? Do you right. want a line or a dot or whatever? Okay. So I'll just say. I, I see the result here. It, it works. So I just want. Yeah, yeah, that's an L. Uh, it should be an L. So when you get to plot, plotting things. So if I say plot our norm, one hundred. So that's my plot. Type equals L. So that's an L and not a 1, basically. Type is one of the um, options you can give to the plot function. It tells you basically what kind of symbology to use. So it's one, one of the types of ways to specify symbology. There's um, L, a B says both. And I'll type help plot because I don't remember the others. Okay. So P. The three, the, the three that I remember are P, L, and B. So P for points, L for line, and B for both. So if you want a point with lines connected. Plot is one of the commands with the most optional 
things. So you can do, do a lot with the plot function, just the basic plot function. For, for you, how does it compare to the pi plot? If I have, I prefer to use R for simple plotting. If I have a way to get my data out into a nice, you know, like common delimited format, um, getting data in and out of R to me can be a little awkward. So if I have like a CSV file, I'd much rather use R for, for doing plots. Is that, your, is that your quickest standard format? Yeah. And if you want to use this and quickly convert it to CSV? That's right. Yeah, I mean, if, um, yeah, CSV is kind of the thing. I, like if I can spit something out as an intermediate data or whatever, a CSV, then I like to do that if it's, you know, if it's that kind of data. I use the matplotlib in Python. If it's just something's going on internal to the to the program, and I don't want to have to save data out and switch to R, and I just want to say generate a plot so I can see what's going on. If I'm making a plot for, you know, like a publication or a presentation, I would much rather use R. They put a lot of time into making the graphics look really good, <laughs> I think, and actually making it tweakable. It's uh, I think it's easier to adjust um, with fewer lines of things like in you know matplotlib is kind of like uh, matlab where you have to do separate commands for um, you know everything basically so if you want to put a, a label on the x-axis or a thing and I'm like okay am I operating on the axis object or on the page object or the whatever in, in matplotlib I kind of have to think of that stuff but in R you just type title equals boom and it's just you get it all or you know something like that why is it for? Is that the question? Yeah. Ah, yeah, okay, good. So let's see, let's look back. What is it? Um, okay, so way back here you defined what n is. It's a vector and it's got three numbers in it. The first item is three and the second item is four and the third item is a hundred. And because r starts counting as one in vectors, so that's uh, n1 is 3, n2 is 4, and uh, n3 is 100. Oh, right. uh, from this sequence, th this n2 uh, equal from It's the second value, yeah. Right. Yeah. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. Okay. I can say x equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, x, <coughs> let me do it this. x1, x1 to 3, that's a slice that gives me items 1, 2, and 3. Line width. Oh. Okay. Yeah, that's how thick the line is. Yes. Data frames. This kind of this is like what your question was about attributes of things. This is the only place that you'll come across this in R regularly. The dollar sign is used to access most commonly. Uh, columns in a data frame. So if I say, here, let me just do it. Here. So if I say x is a data frame, person is C, Mike, Rob, um. So I just made a data frame called x. I can see what the column headers are by typing names x. I can access the columns individually by saying x dollar person and like that or x dollar w there are other places a dollar sign pops up but that's the most common and if you type uh, somewhere in here I think I get into the attach function if you say attach to that data frame this is also really common for our, let's say um, you've got this really big data set and it's all in one you know one big spreadsheet so you read it all in, and everything you do is going to be in there. Everything you make is going to be a new column, something like or a graph or something. So you're going to spend all your time working in sort of in this environment of working in this data frame. You don't want to type those dollar signs all the time. So what you can do is say attach. I can say attach x, and now I have available to me the the variables person and w that I didn't have before, and you can say detach so that you can sort of release that, those names, so that you can use those names for something else. So if I say detach x and I type uh, w, not found. 
blind fits. Nice. Yeah, sure. I look, I just type the same way. Mm -hmm. I also got the X label without really? typing X. Right. Oh, I yeah. This, but I still you didn't X. type it, but it said, well, that's because the variable name is X. Oh. So, um, so you I can override. Yeah, okay. see, if, it, if you didn't put that, yeah. it would put y.obs. Oh, yeah. yeah, so let me, let me do one of those. So, he is, right. so see, if I type plot t, comma y, it's going to go ahead and give me axes labels, even if I don't want them. <laughs> it's going to give me the labels that are the variable names. So you can override them with y lab equals the y axis, like that. So does that give you, when you're sort of working through things, being able to do that and have all those defaults in there just makes it more comfortable to be plotting them in that plot lab for you? Makes it, yeah, it makes it quicker to just get something and then you can change what it is versus having to, knowing that you have to build, even for starters, have to build everything that you're going to need to get, get the graph. <laughs> Is that a one or an L? One. Okay, make it a uh, an L. And hit return. Yeah. So I'll show you what that is. If you if you look at the screen here, I'm plotting some data. Uh, if I say type equals p, it makes points like a scatter plot. If I say type equals L, it makes lines. So it's just one of the ways you can change the symbology of the plot. That's What's it? Um, if, if I were, sorry, I kind of got to take If I were trying to... That should be natural log. No, uh, L-O-G should be natural log. Oh, see, yeah, that's... So that works. Yeah. And did you want the base 10 log? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. try log, I see, I don't know, but let's try log 10, L-O-G 10. Or just 10 like that? Yeah. Okay. So that works. Yeah, this is pretty common for uh, across languages. Um, log 10. If I wanted to look up, look up mathematical functions, how would I, am I better to just look online and see what's there? Because you gave, you gave the list. Um. Yeah, that was a, you know, that was sort of an abbreviated list. Yeah, so if you wanted hyperbolic cosecant or thing. Yeah. I honestly, I'd probably just start typing stuff. Until and, you found it. And, well, until five minutes was up, and then I would go, I would Google it. <laughs> okay. Then I Google it, and then. So the, there's no built-in. There is a way to do general topics of help. Uh, is it this? Question mark math. Question question math. Question question math. Question question math. I don't. I guess I must have known that at some point and forgot that I knew it. Uh, so, I don't, actually, that doesn't look that you helpful to me. You help of math, and it suggests question, question, math. Yeah, I didn't really like the way that looked so much, honestly. Okay, so here's one of the, I didn't put this on the list of disadvantages. Googling R, that's like, <laughs> right? It's, uh, it's, uh, but I have to say, they're great, because it, they're the first thing that comes up on Google. So they figured that out somehow. So I want to say R, hype, this is not my list of things that I've typed. Hyperbolic, cosecant, MATLAB. Okay, right, I didn't do the thing I said I would do, which is to just start typing stuff. So this is where you might use in Google, there's a site colon that you can use to constrain a search within a website. Mm -hmm. So you can say site colon r dash project dot org and that will then uh, constrain the search inside of the So we go back here. So I would so I would say this and then colon like that. Kurt? Um put a site colon for the, the URL. Like this? Site colon like that? Yep. Yeah, I think that constrains the search within that website. And then just start typing stuff? Yep. Yeah. Like um it won't do the auto, like, as it goes, kind of stuff. Hyperbolic cosecant. I'm, actually, I don't even know if there is such a thing. Seek our math functions. So I just pasted it into IRC. An example was a fake 
if you cite colon r dash project dot org and then a ten two, I think we'll find a ten two throughout that website. Or next list like this. So there's, oh wait, okay, here we go. I'm getting closer. Hyperbolic function. Yeah. So I typed R math functions and that kind of got me close. And then I went here, I got this. I saw a list of stuff and then I saw cosine. And then it gave me the list of these other ones too. It's not as neat an answer as I would like to give you. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah. Is it okay? Yeah, okay. That. Yeah, it's one of those. <laughs> yeah. I know. See exactly what I was talking about. You know, you get multiple parentheses. It's if I get more than you know two or one set of parentheses, I'm basically confused right away. Site r project dot org. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm on a quest for a possibly non-existent. Mathematical mm -hmm. thing, hyperbolic so cosecant. Yeah, I couldn't find <laughs> hyperbolic. I know, no, we used to use it in physics. Cosecant. Okay. What yet? You'd have to install a package called G. So if you look at all the URLs, you'll see if they all start with, they all are under So they only go to places that are either part of their site or that or are sub subdomains. Yeah. So that you can, so some of them have an extra of their own, you can always make. So sometimes the answer t is that you have to install a package. So in this case for this thing, I'm the, for this math function, I would have to install the g hype package, which 95% of the time is not a big deal at all, installing a new package. Kind of like safe or packages. You know, if you go to that R project, you'll be guaranteed as well. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, circles of different size. I like that one. That's one of my favorite ones. I like making circles of different size. So what's what's the size? Is that uh, is that the how? I forgot what I <laughs> what I said to make it. Um, make the sign. Wait. Oh, how much noise? Yeah. I'm Essentially. Just about to type it. Yeah. How far away they are from the fitted line is going to be the size of that circle. Yeah. Sure. We, um, when we we basically categorize all the data into, into uh, the high and the low. The, the yeah. But how did it know like what criteria how to like group them? Oh, so cut, mm -hmm. and that's the variable, and that one is three different levels. So what it does is it splits it into three equal sections, essentially. Let, let's take a look. It looks like there's a lot more L. Than you know. Yeah. So let's do help cut. To classify the values of a raster object according to which interval they fall in, the intervals are defined by their breaks. So we didn't we didn't have an argument called breaks. That doesn't help me. Divides x into yeah, no, we already knew that. Where that's a good question. Where does cut do the so you could specify the break points. So I could actually say, you know, what levels to do the breaking on. But if you don't, that's a good question. How does it decide? Um, I think that I thought that it was splitting the range evenly. So you wouldn't necessarily get the same number. So it's not trying to do like a like a histogram equalization. It's trying to not trying to make the the levels have the same number of items of each level. I think what it's doing is taking the range, if that's the lowest point and that's the highest point, I think it's just doing this. Uh, okay. And we can ch actually we can we can test that. So make a variable our norm hundred. I want to say, see, uh, okay, is cut r norm three? Is that what it was? Cut b three, b max b zero point three three dimensions. Yeah, that's right. Most objects will have a dimension will be defined on them, and so if you do dim, it will just tell you what the shape of that object is. <coughs> so answering your cut question, I just made a little test data set here called B, which is just 10 random, randomly normal uh, values. I did cut B3, and then I looked to see uh, what the levels were. So here are the levels, minus 2.25 to minus 1.05, that's the first level. And Minus 1.05 is a third of the way through, from the minimum value to the maximum value. You just cut without telling it where you want the breakpoints. You could actually just give it a list of these points, and it will divide that data up. They could be really anywhere. 
um, and it'll divide the data up as belonging to the groups that are defined by those breakpoints. I got a whisker plot. How'd you do that? Were you supposed to? Plot, group, and weight? Oh, yeah. That's right. That's the default. That's awesome. So it overrides plot, and it <coughs> plots uh, box and whisker <coughs> if you've got a fa if the Groups independent are. variable is a factor. Wow. It just knows to do that. <laughs> that's pretty crazy. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's, that's I what... Some people love R. You just get these fantastic plots so fast. It, it, you know, usually, I have to say, usually I don't like it when a program tries to guess what I'm trying to do. It yeah. tries to, you know, but R almost always guesses right. Is there a way to easily save the history of what you've done in your interactive shell to a file? I know you can type history and say how many you want. There would, <laughs> there would have been a way to, from the very beginning, save your whole session to a file using mm -hmm. the sync command. Okay. But since I didn't tell you to do that, mm -hmm. the way to do it would then be to copy paste what you can see in okay. the terminal. So history doesn't take an argument of a file to write to. Um, yeah, I never use it. Because what we'll be doing in class is I type on the turn on logging and also do a history. That's a, yep. So load history. Max right? show equals? So what if I say history, max dot show is 100. Yeah. That may be the way to go. And then how do you specify the file name? And it looks like they had a file name. Mm. File, file equals. equals history. So you do a save history? Well, that's kind of strange. You know what I would do is I'd probably say sync r session dot text or something like that. Okay, and you do that when you start off. But now I can type history, and then I could say history max show is, you know, a thousand or something. And will the sync will actually capture your output too? Let's see. Uh, it didn't. It made a file. It might have to actually flush at some point. Yeah. Experimental programming. Could not find a function save. What was it called? Save history. Oh, you know what? Actually, when you go to log out, it asks you if you want to save your so session. Oh, that yes, no? Well, you know what? And I always ignore it. Okay. I always say no. But yep. if you say yes, it will save everything you did. Okay. Uh, session. Is this a minus or a There's a tilde. Okay. This funny R thing. R, R will give you... R sometimes gives you more ways of doing things than you might want. Um, so if I have a data frame, you have a data frame. Yeah. Weight against age. So I'm just going to set this up. Okay, great. <laughs> I love errors. That's how you learn things, right? So just quickly, there was this question about what the tilde is when we're in, in this data frame. The tilde is um, how R represents uh, mo essentially statistical models. So what we're <laughs> doing is probably the simplest case of saying something is related to something else. And in this case, it's just a simple... Um, X, Y linear relationship. I created a simple data frame, which is sort of partly what is in the, the handout with age and uh, WT here. So I can say plot age against weight. <coughs> and that looks like that. Or I could say plot weight as a function of age. Now, as you get more and more into R, you'll see that tilde more often. And you could do, um, you could use it to actually create statistical model objects that are that can bas basically be as complicated as you like. And then you can use those in various ways. It's, a, it's called a formula. It, so if it's got a tilde in it, that expression mm -hmm. is, is called an R a formula instead of an um, expression. And so this formula, weight against age, in this case it turns out to be it gives you, you know, and if you say plot it, it gives you the same plot as if you had plotted age as the x variable and weight as the y variable. Yeah, so, but if I can, if I do this, wait, let's see what happens here. I really don't know. So what's this? Oh, I think I said, s what does it tell me that is? That's a formula. Again, it's, you know, part of the, rich zoo of our data types. 
wait till the age is a, is a thing called a formula. And if you say plot it, you get the same behavior as if you had said plot the x variable common to y variable. It just happened to be <laughs> to be that because it's the simplest thing you would want to do. Okay. How can I save the How can you do what? You want to save it? Okay, there are a couple ways. One is, you know, if you're working in the IDE, you would save it probably in a pull-down menu. If you're working in the terminal like we are here, just use one of the built-in functions like uh, PDF here if you want to save as a PDF. So if I say PDF and then I say plot, here, let me do this again. So if I say PDF, give a file name like plot.pdf. And then if I say plot r norm 100. And then here's the trick, dev.off at the end. That's really all you have to do. Uh, then it makes this file. So it made that. Which, because my display is set, it's kind of hard to see, but. Can I go back to what? This? Okay. You can use PDF. You can say JPEG. You can say PNG. The sequence is like this. Type whatever the device is, type that thing. In this case, it was PDF. Then do any bunch of stuff you want to do. If that, any of that bunch of stuff includes graphics output, it'll go into this file. Then in the end, you say dev.off, which is sort of weird looking, but that closes the file. So any amount of stuff in between the PDF and the dev off will generate graphics. And i got to get to Kurt's error in a second. What's the difference between using double quotes and single? There should because be. Oh, you got a difference? I did. Interesting. Uh, could you have gotten a difference because you're generating a random sequence differently each time? Oh, is that all? Oh, that's why. Okay. Yeah. Our norm is a random normal whatever. Gotcha. You so know. I missed that one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's yeah. probably why the difference. There shouldn't be a difference. I'm sure there, is. there shouldn't be. I'm pretty sure that single quotes and double quotes are the Thanks. same. Sure. So a whole bunch of us are actually getting, we've been talking on IRC, so a bunch of us are all on the very last command in the introduction. Yeah. Uh, there is equals panel.smooth, and we're all getting an error about argument to you matches multiple formats. Whoa. So really? Is that the error that happened? Yeah. And, 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 and see, I was all like, see? So I was wondering. Like, see, see, see how awesome that is? <laughs> see how awesome that error message is? Um, did you figure out what the problem was? Or no. you, okay. Let's see. Panel Can I see what the error is? Yeah, so it's right. And if you say, if you take out the panel dot smooth, this I was trying to get super fancy here. All right, so get back to it. So there's the error, and mm -hmm. then remove this guy. Yeah, the whole panel equal. So that works. So what's the panel equals panel that smooth is supposed to do? I was supposed to reach into all that the matrix of plots and grab something. Yeah. Of it? The 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 point of the panel business is and God, I wonder if it's changed. Maybe it's changed in two years. But the point was to go inside of those individual boxes yep. and put uh, put those lines inside of there. Yeah, I don't remember that being a problem before. So did the other one work? Or is it just the last one that doesn't work? The other one's great. Really? Plot trees is pretty amazing. With this matrix of you get that three by three. Okay, and then you say the panel if you that first one with panel equals in there, that doesn't work? So this guy works great too. So if we Oh yeah, I wanna see that. So then so that, that adds it. So the panel thing works. Yep. It's just when you say trees dollar height. What if you say attach trees and then just put height? And then get rid so this guy, if we just get, just say height. Just say height. So I think argument two refers to the panel equals smooth part. Yeah. Can you say, what is the, can you try, say names, trees, girth, height, volume. Yeah, see it doesn't know, try to put another very, like something, comma, something. So see what I, th what I think it's doing is it's saying, well, what do you want to plot on the, I need two things if I'm going to make a plot. This is only one. This is just height. So it's upset about the panel. I'm not sure how to make it not upset. Well, that's our one bug for today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess I don't feel too bad. No. But what was it? you got to have a bug during each class. It's pretty, you know, it's got to be like a knock you off the tracks a little bit. Because what would this do? Trees height, that's just the height. What if I said, um, 
Well, it's probably plot.data.frame or something like that. Well, that's the weird thing. It's like I, I, that line almost doesn't even make any sense. I'm, I don't know what I was thinking there. Yeah, tree's height would just be the height variable. Yeah, so you don't have enough the panels to work with, right? Yeah, I almost like that C is like taunting me. It's like, <laughs> see how this doesn't work? <laughs> It's like the me, See how easy it is the me from it. the me from two years ago is torturing the me from now, just for fun. Yeah, I don't know. It, as it's typed, it kind of doesn't make sense, and so uh, all I can do is try to figure out what I was thinking. I would show when I mean I think the one above it actually is, was the main point, was that the plot, um, the plot function by default, using a data frame does, has that behavior of plotting all the variables against each other. And that this panel option allows you to do things inside those boxes. What other point I would be trying to make there? I'm <laughs> sorry, I don't remember. But if anybody can figure out what I was thinking, that's... Uh, these um, multivariate scatter plots, really cool, but can be kind of hard to read right away. Basic idea is you're plotting every variable against every other variable. So if you have x, y, and z, you'll it'll be plotting x, y, z. So here it's just going to plot x on this axis, y, yeah. y on this axis. Here it will plot y on this axis. You know, so so it's going to be whatever this is. This is y against z. This is z against x and so on. Okay. And so down here they're going to be flipped, right? Here this is x against z like that. So that's x and that's z. But up here x is on the vertical axis <laughs> and that's z. Yeah. So it kind of gives you all possible ways to look at the, the columns of data. And if some of them are factors, I think it will do the box plots. Sure, it will do the box plots in there as well. Oh, cool. I hope it helps. Yeah, I think it's nice to like just sort of make your hands. To, and you know, for people who are interested, there, like I said, I have a, about a dozen of these. I was going to put a link to that. And they're all. Website, if that's okay. Sure, and you can just walk right through them. But Kurt, I wanted to just show you something. I don't know if you've seen this, but the hot new uh, package now is called the Dismo package, and it's it's from these like community ecologists, mm -hmm. these um, species distribution guys. So it's Geocode new market. What? Yeah. Does that actually give you a lot long? Okay, we gotta port this to Python then, because that's pretty. So that's new market, and that's my commute to work, and that's my office, and that was five lines of code. <laughs> Wait, how did you get the image in there? I just told it to. I mean, it's. I mean, it's really crazy. So okay. So forget this one. That's just so I don't see a warning message. Yeah. Geocode is part of the Dismo package, yeah. and I say New Market, New Hampshire, and it picks a zoom scale. That's the thing is Geocode. If I said Beach Street, New Market, New Hampshire, it would be more zoomed in. Yeah. Um, e just gets the extent of that. Gmap oh creates an, a map object and then plot done, actually, in these four lines. Is that, now whose map stuff is it getting? Is it Google? Or is what it, it does is it gets a Google map extent. I don't, probably not a whole tile, but it, yeah. it gets a bunch of data. So it's these four lines that cool. make. That is insane. That make that. And it, so if I typed PDF and then those four lines, and this would be a PDF. And then you can annotate it. And the cool, the cool That's stuff. Insane. I mean, you put your own data. I mean, the, the really interesting thing is that you just put your own data over it. And like yep. I did this in five minutes. As soon as I saw a blog, it's from this blog post from. That's insane. These crazy. Isn't that amazing how fast I'm, I'm glad to see you can still be surprised. <laughs> I'm actually su I'm surprised that you're surprised, but I'm pleased. Right, and I just happened to be on this R blog thing because I was like, oh, I'm going to want to see what's, you know, see what the kids are up to. And I was down here somewhere. It's not even on the front page anymore. I mean, basically everything you're looking at is from this morning. This is all from this morning. Whoa. Yesterday, this was at the top. Hey, Geotrix for using R, Dismo, and all this is R stuff. So basically, you know, it's three lines. <laughs>